You've probably already seen our first episode, 50 Insane Facts About North Korea. Did you think we were done? Not even remotely. This is, after all, the number one mass producer of crazy in the world we're talking about. There's always something new and most likely insane to learn about the Hermit Kingdom. And with Dear Leader Kim and President Twitter fingers potentially at each other's throats again, we might as well learn as much as we can about North Korea before the nukes get us all. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics Show. Today we're taking a look at 50 even more insane facts about North Korea. 50. North Korea is the world's only necrocracy, a nation that is still governed by the rules of a former leader, now dead leader. Not to be confused with necromancy. That's when you bring dead dinosaurs back to life with science to open up a theme park for children. 49. North Korea has conducted five nuclear tests since 2006. Despite Western intelligence agencies doubting they would be able to achieve a nuclear breakthrough for another decade. 48. Their last test in 2017 was of a device thought to be 100 kilotons and collapsed the mountain under which it was tested. 47. North Korea's nuclear tests have caused fear of radiation leaks being carried by the wind to Chinese border cities and towns, which lie as close as just 60 miles from the North Korea test site. 46. Further underground tests are feared to cause a volcanic eruption at Mount Paektu, which could be devastating for the North Korean and Chinese countryside. 45. The largest stadium in the world is in Pyongyang. The Rungrado 1st of May Stadium occupies an area of 51 acres and can seat 114,000 people, though has held as many as 150,000 in the past. It's also known as the May Day Stadium. 44. In the late 1990s, several North Korean generals implicated in a plot to assassinate Kim Jong-il were executed in the stadium by burning to death. 43. In 1995, the Japanese New Japan Pro Wrestling and American World Championship Wrestling Leagues held the Collision in Korea pay-per-view event in the May Day Stadium, though its official title was the Pyongyang International Sports and Culture Festival for Peace. 42. When not executing traitorous generals or hosting beefcakes fighting each other in their underwear, the May Day Stadium is best known for the annual Arirang Festival, or as it's known in North Korea, the Grand Mass Gymnastics and Artistic Performance Arirang, because North Korea loves being extremely specific about everything. 41. Taking place annually between 2002 and 2013, with the exception of 2006, the games were cancelled in 2014 but returned in 2018 under the name The Glorious Country. Not enough adjectives if you ask us. 40. North Koreans are handpicked to be part of the Arirang as young as 5 years old and expected to surf in this fashion until retirement age. 39. In August 2007, the Arirang Mass Games were recognized by Guinness World Records as the largest gymnastic display, with 100,090 gymnasts performing at once. 38. Besides not starving to death, other popular sports in North Korea include football, soccer for American viewers, basketball, speed skating, hockey, and of course gymnastics. North Korea even has a small domestic football league that plays all its games in the Kim Jong-il Stadium. 37. June 25th is the start of North Korea's struggle against U.S. imperialism month. We bet you can't guess what the central theme is. 36. North Korean propaganda routinely features fictional scenes from the Korean War of Americans committing atrocities. The Sinchon Museum of American War Atrocities commemorates the deaths of more than 35,000 people North Korea claims Americans slaughtered at the start of the Korean War. A completely fabricated event or fake news, it's unknown if the death toll of 35,000 is greater than the U.S.'s Bowling Green Massacre. 35. In 2014, Kim Jong-un described Americans as cannibals and homicides seeking pleasure in slaughter. 34. In 2017, U.S. President Trump took to the most hallowed of international diplomatic tools known as Twitter and called Kim Jong-un Little Rocket Man and alluded that he was short and fat. In response, Kim called President Trump a mentally deranged U.S. dotard on a televised broadcast. And that's how the world works now. 33. Despite this exchange of nuclear insults, Kim invited President Trump to a face-to-face -face meeting and removed a great deal of anti-American propaganda from their prominent displays all over Pyongyang. 32. After an initial bromance for the ages, things however seem to have cooled down considerably and Kim Jong-un is widely reported to be secretly resuming his nuclear program while lying about his intentions. Foreign policy experts around the world were in shock at the revelation that a murderous dictator who maintains his grip on power through fear and violence was not being honest about his intentions. 
31. A key feature of North Korean propaganda is the on-the-spot guidance, a tool meant to further the image of a caring, omniscient, and great leader offering benevolent guidance to ordinary workers and citizens. Typically, these take the form of highly choreographed visits to factories and farms around the nation and serve to further build a cult of personality built around the Kim family. 30. Every year, state-owned publishing houses release several cartoons called Giram Chaik, which mostly feature scheming capitalists from the US or Japan, creating dilemmas for naive North Korean characters. 29. In 2004 and 2005, North Korea aired a television program entitled Let's Trim Our Hair in Accordance with the Socialist Lifestyle. The show featured acceptable and proper hairstyles and claimed that hair can affect human intelligence because it deprives the rest of the body of nutrients as it grows. 28. Another television program featured a hidden camera in Pyongyang, which would catch citizens with improper hairstyles. Those caught would be interviewed by the presenter and asked to explain themselves. Their name, address, and workplace would then be announced to deter others. 27. The North Korean village of Kijongdong is situated along the Korean DMZ, and North Korea claims it houses 200 families who work collective farms in the area. However, closer inspection with telescopic devices has shown that the brightly colored buildings are empty and don't have window glass or even an interior. 26. The village, also known as Propaganda Village, is meant to entice South Korean defectors. To date, only a few dozen have tried to defect to North Korea, while many thousands have fled to South Korea. 25. In 2013, six men and one woman defected to North Korea after one of them posted a series of pro-North Korean messages online, which were shared by the country's main newspaper. Thinking he would be welcome into the country, he and six others made the trek into the north. 24. Upon entering the country, all seven defectors were thrown into prison for up to 45 months. One man claimed he was kept in solitary confinement the entire time, and another of the men strangled his wife and then tried to kill himself in a suicide pact. North Korean officials claimed the woman died because of a quarrel with her husband. 23. After being returned to South Korea, the survivors faced up to 10 years imprisonment for their attempt to defect to the North. 22. North Korea maintains a secret network of informants that spy on their fellow citizens and report criminal or subversive behavior, such as listening to non-state radio or TV broadcasts, or watching foreign films. 21. North Korea's most popular tourist attraction is visiting Kim Jong-il's preserved body. 20. It is a widely known fact in North Korea that Kim Jong-un learned how to drive at the age of three and is a skilled composer and musician. 19. Kim Jong-il's birth was prophesized by a swallow and signaled by a double rainbow over Mount Paektu and the appearance of a new star in the sky. 18. Kim Jong-il started walking at three weeks old and began speaking at eight weeks. 17. While attending Kim Il-sung University, Kim Jong-il authored 1,500 books in three years and composed six full operas. The operas are naturally widely recognized as the greatest in the history of music, both past, present, and future. 16. Kim Jong-il also invented, completely on his own, a delicacy called gogigwiopang, which is described as double bread with meat. In the rest of the world, it's called a hamburger. 15. It's well documented that Kim Jong-il could control the weather with his mood and that he had magical abilities that helped him control the weather. 14. Kim Jong-il holds the record for the best round in the history of the game of golf, having shot 38 under par, 25 shots better than the world record, and scoring 11 holes in one. 13. Imperialist capitalist psychologists around the world claim that Kim Jong-il actually suffered from the Big Six group of personality disorders, making him paranoid, antisocial, narcissistic, sadistic, schizoid, and schizotypal. It's believed Hitler, Hussein, and Stalin also suffered from these disorders. 12. Kim Jong-il was completely obsessed with his rice. He made female staff inspect each grain individually to ensure they had the right length, weight, and color, and insisted it only be cooked over a fire made with wood taken from trees that only grew on a particular Chinese mountain. 11. Recuperating from injuries after falling off his horse, Kim became so terrified of becoming addicted to painkillers that he forced others around him to take the same dosage he did so he wouldn't get hooked alone. 10. In 2016, North Korea claimed to have produced a miracle drug made of rare earth elements which could cure AIDS, most cancers, and destroy the Ebola virus. Unfortunately for us, North Korean scientists declined to share details about the ingredients or how to manufacture the drug. 9. 
For years, North Korean propaganda claimed that the dear leaders didn't poop. The poopless image of the current dear leader, Kim Jong-un, was shattered, however, when it was revealed that he had a mobile toilet built into one of the vehicles of his personal convoy for when he traveled around the country. 8. Any other North Korean official found using the dear toilet would face severe punishment, to include death. 7. In 2012, the Korean Central News Agency informed the world that North Korean researchers from the Academy of Social Sciences had discovered a unicorn lair. The lair must not have been particularly difficult to spot, as it was only 200 meters away from a temple and featured a rectangular rock with the words unicorn lair written on it. 6. Just days before the unicorn story hit the international news, China's Communist Party newspaper ran a story hailing a report by The Onion naming Kim Jong-un as the sexiest man alive, not realizing it was satire. This is really why you need a free and independent press, guys. 5. North Korea claims it has no citizens with disabilities, but defectors claim that officials kill babies with disabilities and that men with dwarfism are castrated and forced to live in an isolated village. 4. When Kim Jong-il passed away, the Korean Central News Agency reported that ice formed over a holy lake cracked, lights lit up the top of a sacred mountain, and snowstorms hit parts of the country at the moment he died. They also reported that flocks of magpies grieved in front of a statue of Kim Jong-il and his father Kim Il-sung. 3. In 2016, North Korea invented a new type of beer that wouldn't lead to hangovers despite an alcohol content of 40%. Sadly for the frat bros around the world, North Korea to date hasn't shared the recipe with the world or given any hint that it actually exists. 2. In 2010, articles in North Korea claimed that Kim Jong-il had set a global fashion trend with his modest gray suits, which, quote, leave a deep impression on people's minds in the world, unquote. 1. A total of four U.S. soldiers defected to North Korea during or after the Korean War, the most famous of which was James Joseph Dresnok. He became a national celebrity, portraying American villages in various anti-American feature films and television shows. He died in November 2016 of a stroke and told his sons to remain loyal to Kim Jong-un and that they would destroy the U.S. if it launched an attack against North Korea. What other insane facts about North Korea have you heard of? Did North Korea really discover unicorns or is the capitalist imperialist New World Order simply trying to diminish North Korea's glorious scientific advancements? Also, be sure to check out our other show, A Day in the Life of Kim Jong Un. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time. At 34 years old, Kim Jong-un is one of the youngest world leaders alive today, and he's certainly by far the most infamous. But what makes him so terrifying? Today, we'll take a look at some of the cruelest things he's done. In this episode of the Infographic Show, How Brutal is Kim Jong-un? In 2011, the world was formally introduced to Kim Jong-un, the third dynastic ruler of North Korea since 1950. Kim's cruelty started almost as soon as he assumed power. Faced with the specter of a possible coup from within the ranks of the nation's top political and military elite, Kim Jong-un immediately began a political purge that is rumored to have killed dozens of senior officials. In his bid to consolidate power and prevent any challenge to his authority, he even went so far as to have his own uncle executed, and years later, paranoia concerning his half-brother led him to dispatch assassins to Kuala Lumpur in 2017. But political purges are simply par for the course concerning Kim's cruelty. His real crimes against humanity are committed on a daily basis against his own citizens. Wait until you hear about the laws they must follow and the penalties they incur for breaking them. The hallmark of North Korean cruelty is known as the Three Generations Rule, established in 1972 by Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's grandfather. The Three Generations Rule mandates that any serious crime warrants punishing not just the offender, but three generations of his or her family as well. This is, according to Kim Il-sung, the only way to exterminate the seed of evil completely. What this means is that in North Korea, if your father committed a grave crime against the state, you and your children would also be sent to a prison camp alongside him for the rest of your life. The three generations rule is supposed to be only for great offenses, but testimony from North Korean defectors and escapees shows that it has been enacted for offenses from political dissent to failing to remove dust from a portrait of any of the Kim ruling family members. 
Conditions inside the labor camps are purposefully cruel as well, with prisoners being fed barely enough to stay alive and forced to try to catch rats and insects to eat. Survivors have described 12-hour hard labor workdays, seven days a week, with people becoming physically stunted and deformed from the unceasing work. Beatings, torture, and rape are all commonplace in these camps, and there exists no possibility of parole. North Korea's constitution technically guarantees freedom of the press, but the state does not allow any foreign or non-state sponsored media to operate. It is therefore technically illegal to operate any independent press, and this is a law that Kim's North Korea enforces strictly. All foreign media is completely banned from the nation, making it illegal to watch foreign TV shows or movies, listen to foreign radio or music, or even read foreign books. While North Korea does have a state-run version of the internet that is open to all citizens, government permission is first needed to own a computer, and only state-approved content is available. Occasionally, outside websites are made available, but they are heavily censored after being downloaded and hosted locally. Violating any of North Korea's media rules is met with strict punishment with either execution or imprisonment in a forced labor camp. North Korea's constitution also technically guarantees freedom of religion, but Kim Jong-un's government is extremely hostile to the idea of any religion and the practice of it is banned by law. In its place is a national ideology of Juche, a hybrid fusion of Marxism and Korean nationalism created by Kim Il-sung. Juche states that man is the master of his own destiny and that the North Korean masses are to act as masters of their revolution and in the construction of their own socialist state. The Juche ideology preaches strong nationalism and self-reliance, but makes no mention of any divine creator or other spiritual entities. Wary of what the Kim family believes to be corrupting Western influences, all other religions are banned in North Korea, and anyone caught practicing any other religion faces immediate imprisonment, often with the dreaded three generations rule in effect. Kim Jong-un has also continued his father and grandfather's practice of tightly controlling the movement of its own citizens. It is illegal in North Korea to leave the country without official permission, which is almost never granted. While thousands of defectors and refugees still attempt to flee across the border into China or through the heavily mined DMZ into South Korea, they do so knowing that their families they leave behind will likely be punished in their absence. Even those that manage to successfully escape, though, are still not safe, as North Korea has for a long time conducted international abductions and forced repatriations of escaped citizens. North Koreans in Japan, South Korea, China, and even as far as Europe have all been the target of North Korean abduction squads who force the individual back home under threat of violence. Sometimes they even drug them and smuggle them back home. Once returned, you guessed it, they face execution or forced imprisonment, where they will likely join whatever family they left behind in a forced labor camp. But pregnant women who are captured and repatriated face yet another of Kim's horrors, his belief in complete racial purity and Korean superiority. If a woman becomes pregnant while abroad, the child is killed, and if she is returned home pregnant, she's forced to have an abortion. One report from an escaped North Korean told of a woman in a hospital who gave birth only to have the baby immediately smothered to death. Kim Jong-un's government preaches self-reliance, yet it is completely unable to meet the needs of its own people. In its place, a black market has sprung up, and often it is the only place that food and medicine can be found. Yet Kim has continued his father and grandfather's abolishment of a free market system, so any private enterprise is completely banned in the nation. Those caught dealing smuggled goods or trying to start up their own business are imprisoned, though it is a well-known fact that corruption is so rampant among North Korea's police and military that most officials will look the other way in exchange for a hefty bribe. Theft, however, is still harshly dealt with, even things that would seem petty to you and I. In 2016, 21-year-old American college student Otto Warmbier, on a sponsored tour of the nation, stole a propaganda poster off his hotel's wall and was caught. His sentence was 15 years of hard labor for trying to harm the motivation and work ethic of the Korean people. Though he was released to the US 17 months later, Warmbier suffered severe brain trauma by then, likely due to severe torture and starvation, and died days later. In North Korea, your freedom, everything from what you watch, read, or even where you can work, is severely restricted, and there exists no due process. The country is ruled completely and absolutely through the brutality of Kim Jong-un alone, who fears dissent so much that he is willing to go to extreme lengths to prevent it. While you may occasionally get annoyed by the rules and laws in your own country, at least give thanks that, safe at home, you don't face the possibility of getting sent, along with your entire family, to prison for failing to dust the portrait of your country's ruler.
So, what do you think about Kim Jong-un's brutality? Are there any unfair or unjust laws in your country? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called What If Hitler Had Won? Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time! Even though it's been seven years since he assumed power, Kim Jong-un remains an enigmatic figure. In North Korea, he is revered as almost godlike thanks to the state ideology of Juche. In the Western world, however, he is viewed much differently. He has been described as a nuclear lunatic in one news article and an overweight madman with a funny haircut in another. What is he really like, though? And what is it like to rule over what Human Rights Watch describes as one of the most repressive authoritarian states in the world? That's what we'll find out in this episode of The Infographic Show, what Kim Jong-un does in his daily life. Because North Korea is a closed society, information about Kim Jong-un's whereabouts is tightly controlled. What we know about his daily life is pieced together from North Korea's state-run media and from accounts of people who know him personally. Some aspects of his life are kept secret, but others have been widely publicized. As the supreme leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un must devote part of his day to running his country. Nearly every day, he makes official visits to places throughout North Korea, including factories, farms, and construction sites. Reports of these visits are posted online in a special supreme leader activity section of Rodong Sinmun, the state newspaper of North Korea. One reason for these visits is that they help to promote his political strategy of Byungjin, which a Vox article describes as developing both nuclear weapons and the economy equally. Some of the construction sites he visits are for what a CNBC article calls expanded tourism that would generate hard currency. Another article describes how a model collective farm with 400 families was benefiting from his economic reform of giving farmers control over what they could produce and sell as long as they could meet their state quotas first in Chinese-style reforms of the 1980s. Reliable information about the impact of his economic reform is difficult to obtain, but economists estimate North Korea growth rates of between 1-2% to since Kim Jong-un came to power. Newsweek reports that another purpose of these visits is also to give the impression that Kim Jong-un is devoted to his people. Unfortunately, it is mainly a false impression. Most of the time, he lives separated from them, spending most of the country's wealth on the military, about 24% of North Korea's GDP, and creating a cushy life for himself and his elite inner social circle. In fact, 20% of the state's budget is spent just for his thoroughbred horses. While some North Koreans may dislike the way he runs the country, they remain silent out of fear. According to a 2013 Human Rights Watch report, North Korea operates a vast network of informants who monitor and report to the authorities fellow citizens they suspect of criminal or subversive behavior. And in 2018, Human Rights Watch reported that the government continued to generate fearful obedience from citizens by means of threatened and actual execution, detention, and forced labor under harsh, sometimes fatal, conditions. Out of public view, he spends the day attending to other state business. He continues to manage his nuclear program, which is still up and running despite recent negotiations with the United States. A recently published Foreign Affairs article reported that he is not cheating on his agreement with the United States because he never promised to stop producing nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles. He also probably spends part of his day keeping track of his enemies and figuring out new, terrifying ways to deal with them. His brutal treatment toward those who plot to overthrow him is well known. A New York Times article reports that in the first six years as leader, he has ordered the executions of at least 340 people. Some of these executions made headlines because they involved members of his own family, such as the execution of his uncle, Jang Song Faik, for treason in 2013. Bloomberg reports that last year, he had his half-brother Kim Jong-nam killed with a chemical weapon at an airport in Malaysia, a move that removed one of his last remaining rivals for power in the bloodline. While we don't know if Kim Jong-un orders executions every day, we can safely say that they are a regular part of his routine to maintain power. However, Kim Jong-un has a softer side too. Since 2009, he has been married to Ri Sol Ju. She is supposedly a former cheerleader and singer, but a Business Insider article reports that little is known about the life Ri led before marrying Kim. She is recognized for being stylish and has recently appeared more frequently by his side at public events as part of his image makeover to be seen as a normal leader. It is widely reported that the couple have three children, but not much is known about them. An odd source of insight into Kim Jong-un's family life is former NBA player Dennis Rodman, who has become Kim Jong-un's friend. 
The Sun reports he confirmed that the second of Kim Jong-un's children is a girl named Kim Joo-ae. He also described Kim Jong-un as a good dad who has a good family. Would Rodman provide such a glowing review of the dictator as a family man if he knew about his extramarital sexcapades? A North Korean defector claims that Kim Jong-un has sex slaves. As a former member of his elite inner circle, she recalls seeing some of her attractive teenage classmates pulled out of school to work at one of his hundreds of homes in Pyongyang. She said they are trained not only to serve him food, but also to give him massages and sex as well. It's not easy to be a sex slave to a 290 pound dictator who could make you disappear if you do not please him. So the hazard pay for their service is that they have the opportunity to marry a high ranking official after Kim Jong-un discards them. While his wife is probably not happy about the sex slaves, Kim Jong-un and his family live in luxury. According to MSN, they have 17 palaces scattered throughout the state and even a private island. Newsweek reports that his main palace at Ryongsang covers 4.6 square miles and includes an Olympic-sized swimming pool, banquet facilities, a shooting range, and even a giant water slide. MSN also lists other expensive items he owns, including a 200-foot custom-designed yacht, a private jet called Air Force Un that is estimated to cost around $1.5 million, and a $1.7 million armored car for state visits. Perhaps the biggest part of his daily routine is drinking and eating. MSN reports reports that he spends an average of $30 million each year on imported liquor. Among his drinks of choice are whiskey, cognac, and snake wine, an aphrodisiac which comes with a dead cobra in the bottle, according to one source. A former chef for the Kim family claims that Kim Jong-un could drink two entire bottles of Cristal Champagne in one sitting. MSN also estimates that he spends millions of dollars on fancy imported food, including top quality pork from Denmark, caviar from Iran, and Kobe beef. One of his favorite foods is a mental cheese, which a Sun article states he developed a taste for at a boarding school in Switzerland as a young boy. Kim Jong-un is also a heavy smoker. He can frequently be seen at public appearances with a cigarette in his mouth, and no cheap drugstore brands will do for him. He smokes Yves Saint Laurent cigarettes, which cost $44 per pack, according to MSN. For for those of you who feel outraged that obese Kim Jong-un lives high on the hog while 40% of his people are malnourished, you might find comfort in knowing that he does not always enjoy his luxurious existence. He lives in constant fear of being overthrown by others, and this fear has caused him to suffer sleep deprivation according to one source. Despite being a young man, he is already paying for his overindulgence in lard, liquor, and ladies. According to a Fox News article, experts speculate that he suffers from various serious health problems, including gout, diabetes, high blood pressure, a sexually transmitted disease, and psychological issues. If an assassin's bullet does not do him in, his lavish life of excess probably will. So how long do you think Kim Jong-un will be the dictator of North Korea? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called What Do North Koreans Think of Americans? Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time! North Korea and South Korea, two countries that one would think are exactly the same, couldn't be more different from one another. In fact, their politics, economies, and cultures are so vastly different that unification between the North and South seems all but impossible these days. We thought it would be interesting to take a closer look at what would happen if the North and South once again took up arms against one another in this episode of the infographic show, North Korea vs. South Korea. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. North Korea may be something of a stranger to the developed world, a country purposefully hidden from the prying eyes of the global media, but one thing it doesn't mind us seeing are glimpses of its military strength. The country might only have a small population of just under 25 million, but it's reported that as of 2016, it has around 1,190,000 active military personnel, 600,000 reserves, and a massive 5,889,000 paramilitary force. This makes the Korean People's Army the largest military force on the planet, employing 7,679,000 people, around a quarter of its population. By comparison, it is two and a half times bigger than that of the most powerful military in the world, the USA. Size isn't everything though, as we will soon see. Considering North Korea's huge number of able fighters, you might not be surprised to learn that South Korea also has one of the largest military forces. 
As of 2016, the Republic of Korea Armed Forces consists of around 3,725,000 people from its 51.5 million population. 625,000 are active personnel and 3,100,000 act as reserves. With a military of such numbers, North Korea has to pump 25% of its $40 billion GDP into its defense budget. South Korea has an estimated $2 trillion GDP, of which $36.8 billion is spent on its military. In terms of where the money goes, North Korea lives up to its epithet of the secretive state, and its military arsenal and nuclear capabilities have been a matter of speculation for some time. According to the Federation of American Scientists in 2017, North Korea has an estimated 10 nuclear warheads. Not many compared to the United States 6800, but 10 more than its neighboring southern counterpart. It's said that South Korea has the technology to build nuclear weapons, but has so far chosen not to do so. It's also protected by the USA under what is called a nuclear umbrella. In terms of artillery, the North Korean army has around 6,600 tanks, 4,100 armored fighting vehicles, 2,250 self-propelled guns, 4,300 towed artillery, and 2,400 multiple launch rocket systems. The South Korean army has 2,654 tanks, 2,660 AFVs, 1,990 SPGs, 5,374 towed artillery, and 214 MLRSs. With the North's huge army and its bigger artillery, it certainly has the advantage on land. It's also worth noting that unlike its prosperous neighbors, North Korea implements a Sangan policy on its population, meaning that military service comes before everything. South Koreans, on the other hand, enjoy a much less battle-minded society. Maybe this is why the Korean Economic Research Institute said in 2011 that the North would have the edge in the early days if a war should break out. Nonetheless, and in spite of the North's air defense artillery, it has a fairly weak air force compared to South Korea. Of its 940 aircraft, its strongest flying machines are somewhat out of date. Its fleet partly consists of around 40 Mikoyan MiG-29 fulcrums, 105 MiG-23 floggers, and 35 Sukhoi Su-25 frogfoots. These planes may have been at the forefront of military aviation in the 70s and 80s, but technologically speaking, they pale in comparison to today's military aircraft. According to the Pentagon, the majority of Pyongyang's arsenal consists of only vintage machines. The Republic of Korea Air Force is far more advanced. It consists of around 1,500 aircraft, much of which is uber-modern compared to its foe. While it's still awaiting an order of 40 F-35 Lightning IIs, possibly the world's most advanced jet fighter designed in the US, it also has a number of F-16 Fighting Falcons, F-15K Strike Eagles, and F-A-50s. Even North Korea's respected anti-aircraft missiles would be hard pushed to defend the country against such aerial might. In terms of naval power, North Korea has again been accused of being completely out of its depth in terms of technology, with most of its fleet being built in the 50s and 60s. While it has a large number of vessels, they would not be a viable threat if conflict should occur. In total, it has zero aircraft carriers, four frigates, zero destroyers, six corvettes, 78 submarines, 528 coastal defense craft, and 23 mine warfares. South Korea, by contrast, has a modern navy with its own shipbuilding industry said to be at the forefront of maritime design. In total, it has one aircraft carrier, 12 frigates, 12 destroyers, 16 corvettes, 15 submarines, 70 coastal defense craft, and 11 mine warfares. When it comes to North vs. South in the sea, the general conclusion is we should look at quality, not quantity, with most critics stating the technology of both sides is hardly even comparable. A battle must also be fueled, and here both North Korea and South Korea lack the oil for any kind of protracted conflict. The North produces around 100 barrels of oil per day and consumes around 15,000 barrels a day. It has no oil reserves. The South produces around 500 barrels a day, consumes 2,325,000 barrels daily, and also has no proven oil reserves. It's debatable if any country would come to the aid of North Korea if a war should break out with South Korea. The South, on the other hand, has the advantage of the U.S. as an ally, with 30,000 U.S. troops already stationed in South Korea. It's thought that while North Korea's land advantage might get them off to a good start, it would only be a matter of time until the South and its allies took out anti-aircraft missile sites, command and control centers, its land artillery, and finally the country's infrastructure. If the North decided to use its nuclear arsenal, there are two things that could happen. Either its population would be decimated by U.S. nuclear missiles, or its nuclear weapons would be captured in a land invasion. Given the vast and deadly consequences of the former, it's likely the latter would be the best option. Ultimately, North Korea, even with its huge number of personnel and some say exaggerated weapons programs, would be no match for South Korea and its main ally, the USA. Such a conflict would be devastating, however, and it's one the world does not want to see.
If you like these military comparisons, be sure to watch our video, North Korea vs. the United States. So, who do you think would have the upper hand in a hypothetical war between North Korea and South Korea? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, please consider heading over to our Patreon. We are currently raising money to hire more writers so that we can continue bringing you this bi-weekly show. I knew that if I was caught, I'll be killed. I was born to a Chinese father and North Korean mother. But when I was five, my father abandoned us and left to China and never returned. I lost my mother six years later from starvation. So I ended up living with my aunt until my father sent my stepbrother to take me to China. So I ended up in my father's place in China in 2008. Life in China was so much better. I was so happy because I was living my life in freedom. But the happiness that I felt in China was only temporary because Chinese government didn't recognize North Koreans as refugees and they deported back us to North Korea. The North Korean government wanted me to confess that I was trying to defect to South Korea. But the truth was I went to China to find my father. I had no desire to defect and begged them to understand. I didn't confess and after beating me for weeks, they sent me to labor camp. I was only 15. In the labor camp, I was only allowed to eat 150 kernels of corn a day. One morning, we were marching in our roast at work site, and I saw a dry vomit on the road. I was so hungry that I got on my hands and knees and began picking the rice out of the vomited rice. I didn't stop eating the vomited rice until the beating from the guards were too unbearable. Eight months later, I was finally released because I couldn't even stand up or even lift my arm. After spending months trying to regain my strength, I needed to find a job. I began working in a coal mine where I was paid only in rice. Cave-ins were common, and I saw other boys lose their arms and legs as they were smashed into the rocks. And I watched my friend die when the coal cart fell off the track and crushed them. I worked in the mine about a year, and I realized it was my time to try to escape North Korea again. I knew how hard escaping North Korea would be without any money or food. And I knew that if I was caught, I'll be killed. But those risks overweighted working in the dark coal mine every day until it was my turn to lose a limp or die. One morning, instead of entering the mine, I walked up the path and began running. I spent the next three months hiding from the police and waiting for an opportunity to travel to the border town. On a humid day in August, I was lying down on a hillside. And in the distance, I saw a train come to stop, and I realized the train was going to the border town. And as the passengers boarded again, I joined the line. And the guard would ask for my papers and documents, and I lied that my mother had them and that she was already on the train. He nodded, and I headed straight for the train bathroom to hide. I spent the next two days hiding from the police. I was almost to the border town when the hands of a guard grabbed the back of my neck and dragged me to a holding cell on the train. I thought about how terrible the labor camp had been. The long days of manual labor, sleepless night that I spent memorizing the rules, and the constant feelings of hunger. I refused to let that happen again. As the train began to slow down for the next stop, I saw a window was unlocked, so I pushed it open and squeezed out of the small openings. I jumped off the moving train and rolled into a ditch and began sprinting for some nearby trees. I ran for hours, illegally boarded a second train, and two days later, I finally made it to the border town. I walked into the river that divides North Korea and China, and I hid on the tall grass for eight hours waiting for the darkness. When I finally thought it was safe, I quietly waded into the water. In the middle of the river, I slipped on a rock and let out a scream. Immediately, a flat light was on my back and I heard a guard screaming at me. He said that he would shoot me if I didn't turn back. I knew that I was dead either way. Either he would shoot me or I would obey and return to the shore only to be shipped off to a labor camp. I decided not to turn back each step took me further away from North Korea and closer to my dream of freedom. And five minutes later, I was dripping wet, but finally back in China. I walked in China for three days until somebody found me collapsed in the middle of the road. I was hungry and I was dehydrated. 
and I was exhausted. When the man that found me realized that I was from North Korea, he helped me to make a contact with the people that who helped me to come to Southeast Asia where I was processed to come to the United States. I remember looking out the window as the plane began to land in California. I've never dreamed of being on a plane or even coming to America. And as I stepped off the plane, I felt this strange feeling that I've never known before. Safety. I was finally safe and I didn't need to hide anymore. And I came to America five years ago and in that time I have learned English, graduated from high school, worked as a sushi chef. My life in America has not been easy, but this is land of opportunity. And I know that if I work hard, I can achieve my dreams. And today I stand here as the exception. For every story about a North Korean like mine, thousands of others end in tragedy. And sometimes I wonder why it was me. Why was I the one that survived in a labor camp when my cellmate stopped to death? And why did the coal cart fell off the other side of the rails, crushing my friend instead of me? And why did I get a chance to jump off the train and those two other boys didn't? I struggled with these questions for a long time. And the small gift that I can give to those that are not here today is to share my story. Thank you.